Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tēnā koutou katoa. My name is Chris Marshall. I am the head of the School of Art History, Classics and Religious Studies here at the University. On, on behalf of the University and St John's in the City, I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's lecture. It's good to see the hall filled. We actually do have an overflow facility in case we need it, but um, the wise ones have come early. Before I introduce our speaker, I'm going to invite the Vice-Chancellor to say a few words. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you, Chris. Distinguished guests, representatives from St John's in the city, colleagues, friends of the university, welcome to Victoria University for the inaugural lecture of the St John's Visiting Scholar Public Lecture Series. The St John's Visiting Scholar Program was established at Victoria in 2010 with funding support from St John's in the city to promote the study of religion and theology. And it aims to bring internationally renowned theologians and scholars in religion to Wellington each year to share their knowledge with us. This year's visiting scholar is Bill Kavanagh, Senior Research Professor at the Centre for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology and Professor of Catholic Studies at DePaul University in Chicago. The title of his lecture series, which takes place tonight and over the next three days, is Migrations of the Holy, Questioning the Myths of a Secular Age. An eminent American theologian, Professor Kavanaugh completed his PhD at Duke University in 1996 with a thesis on Torture and the Eucharist in Pinochet's Chile. Professor Kavanaugh has published an impressive range of books and articles in his area of specialization his areas of specialisation, political theology, economics, ethics uh, and ecclesiology. Victoria University's relationship with St John's goes back to 2003 with the signing of a partnership agreement between the church and the university to establish the St John's Senior Lectureship in Christian Theology within the Religious Studies Programme. The position has been held since its inception by Dr Chris Marshall, whom you just heard from, now Associate Professor and Head of the School of Art History, Classics and Religious Studies. Chris's time at Victoria has been immensely successful and he attracts postgraduate students with an interest in Christian theology and ethics. And the feedback from his students has shown him to be an inspirational mentor and from his colleagues an equally inspirational colleague. Contributing to public debate and discussion is an important feature of universities, which are institutions characterised by a spirit of inquiry, and this spirit obviously is shared by St John's. Victoria is working in a range of ways to promote discussion and reflection on the place of religion in society. As the largest department of its kind in Australasia, Victoria's Religious Studies program makes a significant contribution towards promoting interfaith understanding and dialogue, not only amongst students, but also in the public arena. Sponsoring an annual Visiting Scholar program is part of that commitment and benefits the University, St John's, the Theological Fraternity in Wellington and beyond. It also brings intellectual and spiritual enrichment to Wellington's Christian community. I'd like to thank uh, Reverend Alistair Lane, Senior Minister at St John's, along with the generosity of donors in the church for his commitment to bringing the St John's Scholar in Religion, in Religion program to fruition. And I would also like to thank St John's for establishing the St John's Visiting Scholar position. We look forward to working with you and making the partnership a more enduring one. So thank you and enjoy this evening's lecture. And now I'd like to welcome Professor Bill Kavanagh to the podium. Before Bill comes, they're going to tell you a little bit more about his credentials. As uh, Pat said, Bill is the Senior Research Professor at the Center of World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology at DePaul University in Chicago. Uh, interestingly, DePaul University was founded in 1898, which is just one year after this university was established here in Wellington, and it's of a comparable size, a little bit larger than we are but it's the largest Catholic and one of the largest private universities in the United States. Professor Kavanagh received his BA from Notre Dame University in 1984 and his MA from the University of Cambridge in 1987. 
After working as a lay associate with the Holy Cross Order in a poor neighborhood of Santiago in Chile, he joined the Center for Civil and Human Rights at Notre Dame Law School. He completed his PhD in religion at Duke University, Methodist founded university, under the supervision of the very influential American theologian Stanley Hauerwas, who was famously deemed in September of 2001 by Time magazine as America's best theologian. So perhaps Bill is America's best theologian's best product, we'll see. <laughs> After teaching for 10 years at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota, Bill joined the faculty at DePaul University in 2010. In addition to many journal articles, he's published numerous books, including Migrations of the Holy, which appeared last year, from which we have pinched the title for this week's lecture series. Uh, his other books include Torture and Eucharist in 1998, Theopolitical Imagination in 2002, Being Consumed, Economics and Christian Desire in 2008, and The Myth of Religious, Vi Myth of Religious Violence in 2009. He's also the co-editor of the Blackwell Companion to Political Theology and the Erdman's Reader in Contemporary Political Theology and one of the editors of the journal Modern Theology. He's a widely traveled speaker. Delivering le he's delivered lectures at dozens of universities in the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, Belgium, Austria, Spain, Italy, Sweden, the Philippines, and now best of all in New Zealand. It was said of Bill's first book, Eucharist and Torture, that it, and I quote, literally changed the way people around the world discuss the relationship between politics and Catholicism. I think his 2009 book, The Myth of Religious Violence, is a similar game changer. It's a book that makes it virtually impossible to continue framing the discussion about religion and violence in a standard way. The myth of religious violence is the theme of tonight's first lecture in the series, so please welcome Professor Kevin R. to the podium. Well, thank you so much uh, to Chris and the Vice Chancellor and to uh, Alistair and everyone else who's uh, made this possible and has extended Kiwi hospitality to me since I arrived about 24 hours ago. Um, yeah, it's wonderful to be here in the most beautiful country in the world. I got here just in time to watch uh, New Zealand beat Australia in field hockey yesterday in the Olympics, so I thought uh, we'd come in on a high note. Um, so thank you, it's, it's delightful uh, to be here. Uh, and if I fall asleep during my lecture, please just someone nudge me. Um, I've got a little bit of jet lag, but doing, doing fine overall. I um, was once out for a walk, and I uh, came upon a man, a distraught man, who was uh, ready to throw himself off a bridge. And I came up to him and said, um, don't, don't do it. There's, um, there's so much to live for, don't, um, do you believe in God? And he said, yes. And I said, me too. Are you a, a Christian or, or Jewish? And he said, I'm a Christian. And I said, me too. Uh, Catholic or Protestant? And he said, Protestant. And I said, me too. What kind? And he said, Baptist. And I said, me too. Um, Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? <laughs> And he said, Northern Baptist. And I said, me too. Northern conservative Baptist or Northern liberal Baptist? And he said, Northern liberal Baptist. And I said, me too. Northern liberal Baptist Great Lakes region or Northern liberal Baptist New England region? And he said, Northern liberal Baptist Great Lakes region. And I said, me too. Northern Liberal Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Liberal Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912? And he said, Northern Liberal Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879. And I said, die, heretic, and I pushed him off. <laughs> that... Uh, 
That joke by uh, Emo Phillips was recently named the funniest religion joke uh, in the world by an online poll. And I think uh, the fact that it was named the funniest religion joke says something about the way we think about religion, right? We think about it as being peculiarly uh, divisive and uh, prone to violence and emotion and that sort of thing. Um, I gave a lecture entitled, uh, Does Religion Cause Violence uh, at a uh, university in the eastern part of the United States uh, recently? And uh, as I was going towards the lecture hall, I saw a poster advertising um, the lecture and uh, someone had scrawled across it the word, duh. Um, to the question, does religion cause violence? So that tells you something about the status uh, of the question. Everyone knows that religion has a tendency to promote violence, and this story is part of the conventional wisdom of Western societies. It underlies many of our institutions and our policies, from limits on the public role of churches to, uh, in the United States, policy in the Middle East and so on. So tonight I'm going to challenge that conventional wisdom, but not in the ways that it's oftentimes challenged by people who identify themselves as religious. Sometimes you'll hear the argument that the real motivation behind religious violence is not really religion, it's politics or economics or something like that. Um, others will argue that people who do violence are by definition not religious, right? The crusader is not really a Christian because he hasn't understood the real message of Christ and so on. I don't think either of these arguments works. In the first place, it's impossible, I think, to separate out religious from economic and political motives in such a way that religious motives are innocent of violence. How could you, for example, separate religion and politics uh, in Muslim societies when most Muslims don't make that same kind of separation? In the second place, it may be the case that the crusader doesn't understand Christ, but um, you can't therefore excuse Christianity of responsibility. Christianity is not primarily a set of doctrines, but a lived historical experience embodied in the actions of Christians. So I have no intention of excusing Christianity or Islam or any other faith system from careful analysis. Given certain conditions, they can and do promote violence. Now, What's implied, though, in the conventional wisdom is that Christianity, Islam, and other faiths are more inclined toward violence than ideologies and institutions that are identified as secular. Right? So in order for the indictment of religion to hold, religion has to be contrasted with something which is not religion, and that is the secular, something that is less inherently prone to violence, the secular. And it's that story that I'm going to challenge tonight. And um, here's my thesis. I hope you all can see uh, the PowerPoint up there. I'll have some fun pictures later uh, in some text. I'm going to argue that there, are, there is no good reason for thinking that religious ideologies and institutions are more inherently prone to violence than so-called secular ideologies and institutions. And secondly, this is so because there is no essential difference between religious and secular to begin with. These are invented categories and not simply the way things are. So I'm going to look at the political reasons why these categories were invented in the modern West and then show that the idea that something called religion is essentially prone to violence is an ideological justification that can be and is used to justify the violence of many so-called secular orders. The myth of religious violence promotes a dichotomy between us in the secular West who are rational and peacemaking and them, the hordes of religious fanatics over there, Muslims especially these days, their violence is religious and therefore irrational and divisive. Our violence, on the other hand, is secular and rational and peacemaking, and therefore, unfortunately, we find ourselves forced to bomb them into the higher rationality. <laughs> so, here I go. The first section, the incoherence of the argument. I want to start with one of the most famous atheists today, Christopher Hitchens, his best-selling book, uh, God is Not Great, which um, is subtitled with typical British understatement, How Religion Poisons Everything. There he points to abuses uh, by Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Confucianists, and so on. 
he also faces up to the fact that rigidly atheist regimes like those of Joseph Stalin and Kim Jong-il are responsible for tens of millions of deaths and uncounted suffering. So he deals with this little problem by declaring that atheist regimes like Stalin's are religious too. He says totalitarianism aims at human perfection, which is essentially a religious impulse. And so basically religion poisons everything because everything poisonous gets identified as religion. At the same time, everything good ends up on the other side of the religious secular divide. He says of Martin Luther King Jr., quote, in no real as opposed to nominal sense then was he a Christian. He bases this remarkable conclusion on the notion that King was nonviolent while the Bible preaches violence from cover to cover, right? So what is not violent cannot possibly be religious because religion is defined as violent. Now, at this point, we could simply dismiss Hitchens as being peculiarly confused and assume that Stalin, of course, is not really religious and start arguing over who has caused more deaths in the 20th century, atheists or those who believe in God and so on. But that would be to assume too quickly, I think, that we really know what religion is and what religion isn't. Hitchens is useful because he shows that what counts as religion and what doesn't is very fluid and often depends on the kind of political agenda one is pursuing. And Hitchens is by no means alone in this. If you examine arguments that religion causes violence, you find that what counts as religion and what doesn't is largely incoherent. And so I'm going to give uh, a few examples of this. Uh, some of the prominent uh, uh, arguments that religion causes violence, I analyzed nine of them in the first chapter of the book. Um, uh, it, it gets sort of tedious, but I wanted to kind of uh, um, hammer home the point. Here's one. Uh, Martin Marty, preeminent historian of religion. In a book on public religion, Marty argues that religion has a peculiar tendency to be divisive and therefore violent. But then Marty lists 17 different definitions of religion. And then he says, well... I'm not going to give you a definition of religion because scholars will never agree on a definition of religion. And so what he does instead is list five features that mark a religion. He says it's not a definition because we can't have one, but here are five features that uh, mark religion. And then he goes on to show how politics fits all five of the same features. Religion focuses our ultimate concern, and so does politics. Religion builds community, and so does politics. Religion appeals to myth and symbol, and politics mimics this appeal in devotion to the flag, war memorials, and so on down the list. So Marty offers five defining features of religion and then shows how politics fits all five. Now, he's trying to show how closely intertwined religion and politics are, but he ends up, any, he ends up demolishing any theoretical basis for separating the two. Another example, sociologist Mark Jurgensmeyer, whose book Terror in the Mind of God is perhaps the most widely uh, influential academic book on religion and violence. According to Jurgensmeyer, religion exacerbates the tendency to divide people into friends and enemies, good and evil, us and them, by ratcheting divisions up to a cosmic level. But he's forced then to admit the difficulty of separating religious violence from secular violence in his book, The New Cold War, Religious Nationalism Confronts the Secular State, he writes, secular nationalism, like religion, embraces what one scholar calls a doctrine of destiny. One can take this way of looking at secular nationalism a step further and state flatly that secular nationalism is a religion. Now, that's an important concession, as is his claim that the secular is a sort of advanced form of religion. Now, if it's true, though, it subverts the entire basis of most of the books that he's been publishing over the last 20 years, uh, which is based on the sharp divide between religious and secular, and religious and secular violence. Now, for some religion and violence theorists, the confusion around the religious-secular divide is resolved in a functionalist way by openly expanding the definition of religion 
to include ideologies and practices that are usually called secular, and this is what um, Hitchens does, but only in the case of things he doesn't like, right? Stalinism and Kim Jong-il and so on. In his book, Why People Do Bad Things in the Name of Religion, Richard Wentz blames violence on absolutism. Religion has a peculiar tendency towards absolutism, says Wentz, but he casts a very wide net when considering what religion is. These are some of the things that count as religion in Wentz's book. Faith in technology, secular humanism, consumerism, football fanaticism, a host of other worldviews. He has a wonderful scene where he describes the um, American football fan on a Monday night sitting in his recliner, letting his belly pop open his fly and arranging his sandwiches and his beers. Just so, and he describes this whole uh, scene in uh, Eucharistic overtones. Um, and so Wentz is compelled to conclude after all of this, perhaps all of us do bad things in the name of or as a, a representative of religion. Now, um, Wentz should be commended for his consistency, I think, in not trying to erect an artificial division between religious and secular types of absolutism. The price of consistency, however, is that he evacuates his own argument of any explanatory force the word religion in the title of his book, Why People Do Bad Things in the Name of Religion, ends up meaning anything people do that gives their lives order and meaning. So a more economical title for the book just would have been Why People Do Bad Things, right? The, the term religion doesn't have any useful analytical purpose there. So Wentz, Hitchens, Jurgensmeyer, many others um, are not necessarily wrong to include so-called secular things in the category of religion. There's a vast literature on Marxism as religion, for example. Uh, there's an extensive body of scholarship that explores the prevalence of civil religion in the United States, which, as Robert Bella says, has its own seriousness and integrity and requires the same care and understanding that any other religion does, end quote. That's civil religion in the US and, and perhaps some other countries as well. Um, for Bella, religion as such is not privatized in the U.S. Christianity, Judaism, and so on are privatized, but um, the religion of nationalism occupies the public realm. Carolyn Marvin similarly argues that, quote, nationalism is the most powerful religion in the United States and perhaps in many other countries, end quote. And uh, there's a whole uh, raft of scholarly literature exploring the kind of um, nationalism as uh, religion. Let me give you some uh, uh, examples of this. Um, I saw this image and uh, I thought of this one and the similarity between them. This is Our Lady of Mount Carmel and this is Joe Stalin. Um, and the similarities of the kind of uh, iconography are, are really quite striking. Uh, back and forth. <laughs> This, um, this is the image, this is how American school children used to salute the flag and say the Pledge of Allegiance until um, Adolf Hitler made this gesture unpopular in the United States. Um, and so in the sometime in the 1930s it changed to uh, being the hand over the heart. This was the image actually that I asked Oxford University Press to put on the front cover of the book, and they um, they refused. They <laughs> thought it would be a little bit uh, incendiary. Um, so uh, the the image that ended up being on it is a fine image, but not quite as powerful uh, as as this one. Um, many similar uh, pictures. This is not uh, Nuremberg. This is uh, Indianapolis. <laughs> um, and there's there's your buddy. <laughs> I thought you might enjoy seeing all the things you can. Um, Mount Rushmore. Uh, and this uh, recently, I'd, I uh, added this uh, slide recently because the, um, the uh, artist who did this um, was recently given, I don't know, some sort of recognition. Um, uh, National Day in his honor or something like that. I can't even remember what it was, but 
um, the apotheosis of Washington is the name of the painting. It's on the ceiling um, of the U.S. Capitol building, so the dome of the U.S. Capitol building. So you look up, and there it is. And it's called the apotheosis of Washington, the, the kind of deification of Washington, him kind of ascending to godlike status, uh, surrounded by um, all of these kind of uh, mythical figures and so on. It's really quite uh, arresting. Now, um, these are some of the more uh, obvious kind of uh, manifestations, but the, the, what I want to emphasize is that this isn't just uh, peculiar to the United States, and it's not just peculiar to this kind of patriotism. Um, I really don't think, people talk about the resurgence of religion, and I just don't think that there has been a resurgence of religion because I don't think it ever went away. I just think it migrated, and that's the title of the lecture series, The Migrations of the Holy. Um, that it's the, the search for transcendence has migrated into other uh, parts of life. Um, and I think really the strongest is perhaps not, as Carolyn Marvin says, nationalism. But the strongest in the West might be a kind of consumerism where people seek transcendence by um, through uh, um, consumer products. There's a certain sense in which we reinvent ourselves um, by, make, by purchasing something new. And in a way there's, the, there's a sense in which this is a search for uh, the, the kind of search for novelty is a search for a certain kind of transcendence and a certain kind of trying to cheat death, in a sense. That's going to be um, the subject of the, the final lecture in the series uh, on Thursday. Um, in the wake of rolling blackouts in California in 2001, one of the architects of the deregulation of California's electrical utilities was quoted in the New York Times expressing his belief that free markets always work better than state control. He said, quote, I believe in that premise as a matter of religious faith. And um, I think we should just take him at his word, right? Um, scholars who take a Durkheimian functionalist approach take him at his word. A survey of religious studies literature finds the following treated under the rubric religion, totems, witchcraft, human rights, Marxism, liberalism, Freudianism, Japanese tea ceremonies, nationalism, sports fanaticism, free market ideology, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, a host of other institutions and practices. Alcoholics Anonymous was actually uh, declared a religion by a, a U.S. federal judge in 2002. Now, let me see if I can anticipate an objection that's, uh, that's uh, coming into your heads. Um, no, no, no. Religion, we all know, is really about God and gods and those sorts of things. Now, if you think that religion is really about God or gods, then you would need to eliminate certain belief systems that are usually called religions, such as Taoism and Confucianism and many forms of Buddhism, which don't have a central concept of God or gods. So, what happens usually then is they say, okay, well, we need to expand it to include Buddhism and Taoism and so on. So um, let's try something like transcendence, right? Well, once you open up the category to something like transcendence, then it becomes very difficult to exclude the things that you want to exclude and include the things that you want to include in this uh, category of religion. Many that are usually called secular then fall under the definition such as... Um, uh, Marxism and nationalism and so on, because many ideologies and institutions that do not explicitly refer to God or God's function in the same way as those that do, right? This is a, this is a fundamental biblical concept, the idea of idolatry, right? Paul tells the Philippians their gods are their bellies, right? Um, uh, Jesus says you can't serve God and mammon, right? The first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me. The idea that all kinds of things can be treated as substitutes for the divine is simply a basic biblical idea. So expanding the concept of religion to include godless Buddhism makes it difficult to exclude godless Marxism, right? Likewise, it's hard to imagine a better candidate for transcendence than nationalism. The term transcendence is a tool of Western scholars of religion who borrowed the term from the Judeo-Christian tradition with its distinction between a creator god and a created order, 
To apply this term to Buddhism, which has no such distinction, one needs to define transcendence in an exceedingly vague manner. But the vaguer the term becomes, the less justification one has for excluding other systems of belief and practice, such as nationalism. So defining religion in terms of transcendence, the sacred, the super empirical, and so on, just begs the question of what those terms mean. If these terms are made vague enough to be transcultural, then the exclusivity of the term religion breaks down very quickly. And this is particularly relevant, I think, to the question of violence. Is there any good reason to suppose that people are more likely to kill for a god than for a nation? I often ask my audiences in the United States what percentage of Americans who identify themselves as Christians would be willing to kill for Jesus and how many would be willing to kill for their country. And, of course, um, it's obvious that um, uh, amongst uh, American Christians, most, despite what the rest of the world thinks, most American Christians think it's in poor taste to mention uh, Jesus in public, but, and yet we... Uh, routinely organize, uh, endorse organized slaughter on behalf of the nation as sometimes necessary and sometimes laudable. And I think we need to conclude then that there's no, this, um, by the way, um, has got me shouted at by certain uh, audiences, but, uh, but I think it's true. Um, we have to conclude then that there is no coherent way to isolate religious ideologies with a peculiar tendency toward violence from their tamer, secular counterparts, so-called secular ideologies and institutions like nationalism and capitalism can inspire just as much violence as so-called religion. The problem with Hitchens then is not that he thinks Stalinism is a religion. The problem is that if he's going to use such an expansive definition of religion, he should do so consistently, but he doesn't. For Hitchens, American civil religion is not religion, it's secular. Uh, but Stalinism is religious. So the religious secular distinction really is nothing more than the distinction between the things Hitchens likes and the things that he doesn't like. Now, again, note that the problem is not simply that the concept of religion has fuzzy edges, right? Every concept has fuzzy edges, politics, culture, very fuzzy edges. The problem with the religion and violence arguments is not that their working definitions of religion are too fuzzy. The problem is the opposite. They're unjustifiably clear about what counts as religion and what doesn't. Certain belief systems like Islam are condemned while certain others like nationalism are ignored. So my point here is not to argue either for or against an expansive definition of religion. I have no intention of trying to solve once and for all the debate between substantivists and functionalists on whether or not Confucianism or Marxism or free market capitalism is really a religion or not. I don't think there is a once and for all definition of religion. My point is rather that religion is a category which is constructed in different ways in different times and places and according to the interests of who is doing the constructing. So to understand why there's so much confusion around the category of religion, I think we need to examine its history, and that's what I'm going to do next. The basic problem with this idea that religion causes violence is this category of religion. The scholars I've been discussing assume that religion is a transcultural, transhistorical human activity that's essentially different from secular phenomena like politics and economics and so on. In reality, though, the religious-secular distinction is a relatively recent Western creation, and what counts as religion and what counts as secular in any given context is determined by certain political configurations of power. Charles Kimball's book, When Religion Becomes Evil, begins with the following claim. It is sometime, somewhat trite, but nevertheless sadly true, to say that more wars have been waged, more people killed, and these days more evil perpetrated in the name of religion than by any other institutional force in human history. Now, he doesn't provide any evidence for this. He assumes it's too trite to need proving. But if one were to try to prove it, you would need a transhistorical and transcultural concept of religion that would be at least theoretically separable from other institutional forces over the course of history. So an obvious contender might be political institutions, right? The problem is that there was no religion considered as something separable from politics until the modern era, and then primarily in the West, right? So um, 
uh, could you have an argument over whether the Aztecs' bloody human sacrifices were because of the Aztecs' religion or because of their politics? Well, it, the distinction just doesn't hold. Um, the Romans had the term religio, but there was no religious pol religion politics distinction. How could you when Caesar was a god, right? As Wilfred Cantwell Smith showed in his landmark 1962 book, The Meaning and End of Religion, religion as a discrete category of human activity separable from culture, politics, other areas of life, is an invention of the modern West. In the course of a detailed historical study of the concept of religion, Smith concluded that in pre-modern Europe there was no significant concept equivalent to what we think of as religion. The ancient Romans employed the term religio, but it covered all kinds of civic duties and relations of respect that we would consider secular. This is what Augustine says in The City of God. We have no right to affirm with confidence that religio is confined to the worship of God, since it seems that this word has been detached from its normal meaning, in which it refers to an attitude of respect and relations between a man and his neighbor. Right? So a Roman might say, religio mihi est, that it's, it's religion to me, which means that I have a binding obligation to do it, and it might have nothing to do with God or gods. It was just any kind of binding obligation. You, you still hear this sense of religion when somebody says, I read the morning paper religiously. Right? That's, that's the sense in which the term uh, religio is used for the Romans. In the medieval era, the religious secular distinction was used almost exclusively to distinguish between clergy who belonged to an order and diocesan clergy, right? So Catholics still refer to joining an order like the Dominicans as entering the religious life. So the religious secular distinction was a distinction between two different kinds of priests. In 1400, the religions of England were the various orders, the Dominicans, the Benedictines, the Franciscans, and so on. There was no realm of secular pursuits to which God was indifferent. And though there was a distinction between civil and ecclesiastical authorities, there was no distinction between politics and religion as we conceive it. The religious secular distinction as we know it today was a creation of the early modern struggles for power between ecclesiastical and civil authorities in Europe. In the creation of the modern sovereign state between the 15th and 17th centuries, religion was invented as a universal, essentially interior and private impulse that is essentially separate from politics and other secular concerns. So what you could do then is take the church's concern and put it off to one side and say it's essentially non-public, it's essentially non-political, and that obviously advances the uh, interests of, of civil authorities. The idea that religion is a transcultural and transhistorical impulse makes the separation of religion and politics appear natural and inevitable and not a contingent arrangement of power in society. So John Locke insists that um, that he's, he's not just making this up, that this is a distinction which is based in, in natural law. It's just the way it's always been, and medieval Christians somehow got the two things mixed up. But it wasn't that they got the two things mixed up, it's that the two things were invented in the modern era. The religious secular distinction was subsequently exported to non-Western cultures during the process of colonization. Smith's study concludes, quote, that there is no closely equivalent concept to religion in any culture that has not been influenced in, by the modern West, end quote. There was no such concept in ancient Greece, Egypt, China, India, or anywhere else in the ancient world. In their initial encounters with the non-Western world, European explorers reported with remarkable consistency that the natives had no religion at all. I have a long list of um, explorers reporting back home that the natives have no religion at all. Once colonized, however, the category religion became a powerful tool in the classification of native cultures, and it classified them as dis essentially distinct from the business of government. Hinduism, for example, which uh, uh, Hinduism is a term first used in 1829. You have Hindus before then, but not Hinduism. Hinduism becomes a religion in the course of the 19th century despite the fact that it encompassed the entire Indian way of life. Everything we would include under culture, politics, religion, economy, and so on. 
Fritz Stahl has concluded, quote, Hinduism does not merely fail to be a religion, it is not even a meaningful unit of discourse, end quote. Now, that's not a, he doesn't mean to insult Hindus that way. What he means to say is that Hinduism is such a broad uh, concept. It's the entire Indian way of life. It's like talking about Americanism or New Zealandism, right? What does that exactly mean, right? The classification of Hinduism as a religion, though, proves useful to the British colonizers because if Hinduism is a religion, then to be Indian is to be private and to be British is to be public. This is why many contemporary advocates of Hindu nationalism, especially the powerful BJP party, reject the classification of Hinduism as a religion. Richard Cohen says the proponents of Hindutva, Hindu nationalism, refuse to call Hinduism a religion precisely because they want to emphasize that Hinduism is more than mere internalized beliefs. It is social, political, economic, and familial in nature. So the way things get classified does real political work. And for similar reasons, Chinese nationalists in the 19th century denied that Confucianism and Taoism were religions at the same time that they were being classified as religions by Western scholars. For similar reasons, the Chinese government excludes Confucianism from its official lists of religion in China. It is seen as an expression of the national character superior to religion, which is private and otherworldly. So in her book, The Invention of World Religions, Tomoko Masasawa concludes, this concept of religion as a general transcultural phenomenon, yet is also a distinct sphere in its own right, is patently groundless. It came from nowhere, and there is no credible way of demonstrating its factual and empirical substantiality. End quote. In other words, the religious secular distinction is not engraved in the nature of things. It's a distinction that is employed in Western or Westernized societies to marginalize certain kinds of beliefs and practices and to authorize others. And so I'm going to conclude then by giving a few examples of this. If the conventional wisdom then is so um, incoherent, why is it so prevalent? That's what I'm going to talk about in the last section here. I think it's prevalent because we in the West find it useful, both in domestic and foreign policy. I'm going to give you a few examples uh, from domestic and foreign policy that come uh, mostly from the United States, but they might have some relevance to uh, the context here as well. In domestic life in the United States, the myth of religious violence has played a key role in shifting the dominant mode of jurisprudence from what Frederick Geddix calls religious communitarianism to secular individualism. I, I went back and looked at all of the Supreme Court cases in the United, in the United States that refer to, um, that had to do with religion and the, the First Amendment. And what I found was, up until 1940, religion is cited as a unifying um, uh, uh, social effect in the United States, has a unifying social effect. And from 1940s on, the 1940s on, religion is cited as a, a peculiarly divisive and dangerous social force. The first U.S. Supreme Court decision to invoke the myth of religious violence was Minersville School District versus Gobitis in 1940, which upheld compulsory pledging of allegiance to the American flag. Right? This was a case uh, in which Jehovah's Witnesses uh, who refused to uh, salute the flag um, were, uh, were being uh, persecuted. And the majority of the Supreme Court said that they can be coerced to salute the American flag. Justice Felix Frankfurter invoked the specter of religious wars in denying the Jehovah's Witnesses the right to dissent from patriotic rituals. Here's some uh, from the decision. Centuries of strife over the erection of particular dogmas as exclusive or all-comprehending faiths led to the inclusion of a guarantee for religious freedom in the Bill of Rights. The First Amendment sought to guard against repetition of those bitter religious struggles by prohibiting the establishment of a state religion and by securing to every sect the free exercise of its faith. Well, you would assume that the decision would go in favor of the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? Not so. The Jehovah's Witnesses' dissent threatens the promotion of national cohesion. 
We are dealing with an interest inferior to none in the hierarchy of legal values. National unity is the basis of national security. And he goes on to say, what the school authorities are really asserting is the right to awaken in the child's mind considerations as to the significance of the flag contrary to those implanted by the parent. Right? Kind of uh, chilling. Now, the Supreme Court would reverse this decision three years later, but Frankfurter had succeeded in introducing the idea that First Amendment decisions could be made against a backdrop of some unspecified history of bitter religious struggles in the past, the antidote to which is the enforcement of national unity. Now, Martin Marty discusses this case in his book, and he cites many instances of Jehovah's Witnesses who were attacked, beaten, tarred, castrated, imprisoned in the United States in the 1940s because they believed that followers of Jesus Christ could not salute a flag. It was idolatry. Now, uh, this is uh, an example here, rioting against the Jehovah's Witnesses in St. Louis. Now, one would think that Marty then would draw the obvious conclusion that zealous nationalism can cause violence, right? But no. Astonishingly, Marty concludes, it became obvious that religion, which can pose us versus them, or them versus what we think the state should be or do, carries risks and can be perceived by others as dangerous. Religion can cause all kinds of trouble in the public arena, right? Now, what he means by religion here, of course, refers only to the Jehovah's Witnesses, even though they suffered rather than perpetrated the violence, right? So, in this way, the myth of religious violence is used to draw attention away from nationalist violence and towards so-called religious violence, even though, again, the Jehovah's Witness suffered rather than perpetrated the violence. And in the succeeding decades, the myth of religious violence would be invoked by the Supreme Court in case after case in decisions banning school prayer, forbidding voluntary religious instruction on public school property, forbidding state aid to parochial school teachers, and so on and so on. When the court banned school prayer in the Abingdon case in 1963, again invoking the specter of religious violence, Justice Potter Stewart dissented warning of, quote, the establishment of a religion of secularism. And Stewart noted the long history of government religious practice in the U.S., including the fact that the U.S. Supreme Court starts its sessions with God save this honorable court. In their concurring opinion, though, Justices Goldberg and Harlan addressed this objection by drawing a sharp line between patriotic invocations of God and religious ones. All right? They said, there is, of course, nothing in the decision reached here that is inconsistent with the fact that school children and others are officially encouraged to express love for our country by reciting historical documents, such as the Declaration of Independence, which contain references to the deity or singing officially espoused anthems, which include the composer's professions of faith in a supreme being, or with the fact that there are many manifestations in our public, belief, public life of belief in God, such patriotic or ceremonial occasions bear no true resemblance to the unquestioned religious exercise that the state has sponsored in this instance. Right? Now, they don't say why, but clearly um, uh, you can invoke God. If you invoke God in a patriotic way, it's not religion. Right? But if you invoke it also in, in a different way, that then counts it religion, as religion. So what separates religion from what's not religion is not the invocation of God. Separating religion from non-religion in this case depends not on the presence or absence of expressions of faith in God, but on the presence or absence of expressions of faith in the United States of America. Right, so American nationalism is once again the antidote for religious divisiveness. And more specifically, the revulsion to killing and dying in the name of one's religion is one of the principal means by which we become convinced that killing and dying in the name of America is laudable and proper. Which brings us to foreign policy. The conventional wisdom helps to reinforce and justify Western attitudes towards the non-Western world, these days especially Muslims, whose primary point of difference with the West is said to be their stubborn refusal to tame religious passions in the public sphere, 
Hitchens, for example, skewers religion for its violence, but he's been an enthusiastic supporter of the Iraq War and Western military adventures in the Muslim world. Despite his attempt to recruit Martin Luther King to his side, Hitchens has a very approving things to say about killing people. Quote, and I say to the Christians while I'm at it, go love your own enemies. By the way, don't be loving mine. I think the enemies of civilization should be beaten and killed and defeated, and I don't make any apology for it, end quote. For Hitchens, the Iraq War is part of a broader war for secularism, and the game is zero sum. Quote, it is not possible for me to say, well, you pursue your Shiite dream of a hidden imam, and I pursue my study of Thomas Paine and George Orwell, and the world is big enough for both of us. The true believer cannot rest until the whole world bows the knee. End quote. Now, the true believer he has in mind, of course, is the Muslim, but Hitchens' message is that the true believer in secularism also cannot rest until the whole world has been converted to secularism by force if necessary. Fellow new atheist Sam Harris's book about the violence and irrationality of religion dramatically illustrates the same double standards. The End of Faith, the book is called. Harris con condemns the irrational religious torture of witches but provides his own argument for torturing terrorists. His book is charged with the conviction that the secular West cannot reason with religious people but must deal with them by force. Some propositions are so dangerous that it may even be ethical to kill people for believing them. Certain beliefs place their adherents beyond the reach of every peaceful means of persuasion while inspiring them to commit acts of extraordinary violence against others. There is, in fact, no talking to some people. If they cannot be captured, and they often cannot, otherwise tolerant people may be justified in killing them in self-defense. This is what the United States attempted in Afghanistan, and it is what we and other Western powers are bound to attempt at an even greater cost to ourselves and innocence abroad elsewhere in the Muslim world. We will continue to spill blood in what is, at bottom, a war of ideas. Right? Now, his logic here is impeccable. Right? If religious people are irrational, then there's no point in talking to them. You can only use force. So the myth of religious violence becomes a justification for the use of violence. In a chapter entitled The Problem with Islam, Harris writes, in our dialogue with the Muslim world, we are confronted by people who hold beliefs for which there is no rational justification and which therefore cannot even be discussed. And yet these are the very beliefs that underlie many of the demands they are likely to make upon us. This is especially, end quote, this is especially a problem if such people gain access to nuclear weapons. There's little possibility of our having a cold war with an Islamist regime armed with long-range nuclear weapons. In such a situation, the only thing likely to ensure our survival may be a nuclear first strike of our own. Needless to say, this would be an unthinkable crime as it would kill tens of millions of innocent civilians in a single day but it may be the only course of action available to us given what Islamists believe. Right? He goes on to say that Muslims would then likely misinterpret this act of self-defense, <laughs> I swear I'm not making this up, as a genocidal crusade thus plunging the world into nuclear holocaust. Silly, silly Muslims, right? All of this is perfectly insane, of course. I have just described a plausible scenario in which much of the world's population could be annihilated on account of religious ideas that belong on the same shelf with Batman, the Philosopher's Stone, and unicorns. In other words, if we have to slaughter millions of people through a nuclear first strike, it's their fault and their crazy religious beliefs. Before we get to that point, though, Harris continues, we must encourage civil society in Islamic countries, but we cannot trust them to vote it in. It seems all but certain that some form of benign dictatorship will generally be necessary to bridge the gap, but benignity is the key, and if it cannot emerge from within a state, it must be imposed from without. The means of such imposition are necessarily crude. They amount to economic isolation, military intervention, or some combination of both. While this may seem an exceedingly arrogant doctrine to espouse, gee, you think it appears we have no alternatives. Now, to conclude then,
Harris's book is a particularly blunt version of this kind of reasoning, but he's by no means isolated. This book was a New York Times bestseller. It won the 2005 Penn Award for nonfiction, and it's been enthusiastically endorsed by such academic superstars as Alan Dershowitz, Richard Dawkins, and Peter Singer. Uh, Peter Singer is, uh, is the same Peter Singer who thinks that it's unjustifiable to eat uh, irrational animals uh, for food, um, but apparently the treatment of irrational Muslims is something different. Harris's logic, I'm afraid, is little different in practice from the Bush doctrine that America has access to liberal values that are right and true for every person in every society, and that America will take preemptive military action if necessary to promote such values. Um, that was a quote from uh, George Bush's national security policy. Now, uh, to conclude then, I don't wish either to deny the virtues of liberalism nor to exclude the, the, excuse the vices of other kinds of social orders. What I'm trying to do here is level the playing field so that we examine the violence that can be generated by the concept of jihad, for example, or the sacrificial atonement of Christ but we also examine the violence that can be generated by ideologies of free markets and free elections. Put simply, my argument is that people kill for all sorts of things, things like money and flags and oil and freedom that function as gods in people's lives. I wish to challenge the religious secular dichotomy that causes us to turn a blind eye to liberal forms of imperialism and violence insofar as the myth of religious violence creates the villains against which a liberal social order defines itself, the myth is really little different than previous forms of Western imperialism that established the inferiority of non-Western others and subjected them to Western power in the hopes of making them be more like us. If the argument is taken seriously, it would neither vilify Western-style liberalism nor justify theocracy, but rather help us to see that these are not the only two choices there are. U.S. foreign policy would, could refrain from insisting that Muslims choose between Canada and Iran. Violence, I think, feeds on the need for enemies, the need to separate us from them. Such binary ways of dividing the world make the world understandable for us but they also make the world unlivable for many. So doing away with the myth of religious violence is one way of resisting such binaries and perhaps turning some enemies into friends. Thank you.